Welcome back. We're going to continue our reading in White Monster today. Um, it's chapter 4. At the end of today, you're going to summarize chapter 4. Just tell me the main events that happened today as I read. Jordan hurled the iron, the tire iron at the moving animal. End over end, it cartwheeled through the air, but Jordan hadn't accounted for the rabbit speed. By the time the tire iron reached the spot Jordan had aimed at, the rabbit had passed. Then it vanished in a burst of speed, sailing over the snow like a white bird and disappearing into a sand of evergreens a few yards away. Oh man, he cried, I couldn't even hit a rabbit. How could I have not accounted for its speed? Dad's right. I can't do anything right. Yeah, you can, Lee assured him. You do lots of things right, but neither one of us knows anything about catching a rabbit. We're city boys, not mountain men. Lee's words did not help. Jordan had never gone 24 hours between meals. He had never experienced the hunger he felt now. He wondered dully how it must have felt to go days, even weeks, without any real substance, as the Donner Party had. He doubted he would have been able to survive it. Come on, let's get in the car, Jordan Lee said, rubbing his arms. First, I better go get the tire iron, Jordan said. You never know when we might need it. Jordan trudged through the snow and retrieved the tool. Then the two boys stumbled back to the car. Silently, he and Lee began restuffing their clothes with newspaper. As he worked, Jordan thought about the environmental biology of class again. The last straw had been when he didn't do the paper on an endangered species. Three pages. It would have been so easy. It probably wouldn't have taken him more than an hour to do it on the computer, research, typing, and all. How hard was that? But Jordan couldn't give up, even an hour of his precious time, and so Mr. McGuire had given him a D on his midterm progress report. That's why he was there. That's why they were there. I don't know why we're doing this, Jordan cried, throwing a piece of newspaper on the floor. I'd rather freeze to death than starve to death. Keeping ourselves warm with newspapers is just going to prolong our misery. Come on, Jordan, don't say that, Lee pleaded. We're not going to die. You said we were going to get out of here, and I believe you. Don't you give up on me now. Jordan banged his forehead with his fist. What was I thinking, driving up here in the rain? I know rain down there means snow up here. I know that. I wish Dad had knocked the living daylights out of me while he had the chance. Maybe it would have turned me around. But all he did was yell, and I got used to it, that I didn't even hear him anymore. There's got to be something to eat around here, Lee said desperately, glancing around at the white landscape. Snow. Yeah, there's plenty of snow. Good old snow, Jordan said bitterly. Like ice cream, but without the taste or calories. Yum, yum. Jordan, cut it out, Lee said nervously. Listen, we can't get all excited. We have to use our heads. How did the Indians in the old days survive around here? Indians probably didn't live in the high mountains in winter, Lee, Jordan said. They had more sense. They probably lived down in the lower country, where they could fish and stuff. They didn't come this high until the weather had cleared. Then they hunted with real weapons, not tire irons. Indians were smart and planned for the worst. They weren't stupid like me. He shook his head sadly. He had never felt more miserable. Come on, Jordan, Lee urged. That kind of talk isn't going to get us anywhere. We've got to stay calm and figure a way out of this. Jordan knew Lee was right. He took a deep breath to calm himself down. Okay, we can't just sit here waiting for somebody to come rescue us, because that's not going to happen, he said. In the morning, we're going to start walking down the mountain, no matter what. When the first light comes, we move. Agree? Agreed, Lee said although he glanced nervously out the window. They passed another miserable night in the car, but when dawn came, it wasn't snowing anymore. The clouds were heavy overhead, but no snow was actually coming down. The monster seemed to be napping for now, but when would it awaken again? Jordan wondered. He thought they better get going while they still could. Okay, the first thing we have to do is find the road we came up on, Jordan told Lee as they stuffed extra newspapers in their clothes. Should a piece of should be a piece of cake, right? Jordan noticed that Lee did not answer. He looked up and saw his friend nervously staring out the window. Are you sure you're up to this, Lee? 
Jordan asked, because I can go without you and come back when I find help. Panic flashed into Lee's eyes, just as it had the first time Jordan had left him to go to the ridge. I'm up to it, Jordan. Honest, he said. I'm coming with you. Okay, then. Let's go, Jordan said. Wrapping himself in their seat covers, Jordan and Lee headed out. It was icy cold, but not snowing as the boy used the tire and iron and ice scraper to poke around in the snow to search for pavement. Jordan was glad to see that the wind had died down some. Suddenly, Jordan felt something more solid than frozen earth. Here it is, pavement, he shouted. Good, Lee said. Now which direction do we go? Let me think, Jordan said. We were going north when we came up here, so we head south now. Okay, Lee said. I think I remember that stand of pines being on our right when we drove up here, so it ought to be on our left going down, Jordan said. Right, Lee said, his teach his teeth chattering. This way, Jordan said, trying to sound confident. He plunged ahead, and Lee followed in his tracks. Jordan glanced at the snow and saw that it was growing darker at the sky and saw that it was growing darker again. He tried to ignore the fear that welled up in him. They had to keep moving, to get to a lower elevation where it wasn't so cold. But if another blizzard came and caught them in the open, they were goners. A few minutes later, Lee spoke the dreaded words that were in Jordan's mind. You don't think it will snow again, do you? He said. Let's just keep walking, Jordan said, avoiding Lee's question. But even though they were putting all their efforts into it, they couldn't move very fast. The snow was too deep to make rapid progress. Jordan knew that slogging through the snow like this would never enable them to outrun a storm. Fear and uncertainty gnawed at Jordan's inside. Am I making another terrible mistake, he wondered? Am I dooming myself and Lee with yet another insane idea? Worse than coming up here in the first place. If another storm hits, we'll be too far from the car, our only shelter, to make it back? Jordan glanced back at the car. Luckily, it was black, so he could still see it against the white landscape. He saw Lee looking back, too, and wondered if Lee wanted to go back. But his friend said nothing. Jordan knew that Lee would follow him to the ends of the earth if he asked him to. They were only gone about a hundred more feet when out of nowhere the wind picked up. Within minutes, snowflakes started flying. A few at first and then many more. Jordan glanced back. He could no longer see the car in the swirl of flakes. The monster had awakened. Suddenly the terror Jordan had been feeling overwhelmed him. In another five minutes, they would be caught in the open floundering, floundering hopelessly in the snow. We've got to head back, Jordan screamed over the howl of the wind. Lee nodded. He turned quickly. He stumbled and sank into the snow. Get up, Jordan shouted, grabbing Lee's arm and dragging him to his feet. Come on, come on. Jordan looked around desperately for the car, but he could no, but he could see no signs of it. It was as if a white curtain had been drawn between them and where they had come from. Can you see the car? Jordan shouted. No, but it must be this way, Lee shouted back. Jordan thought again about the Donner Party, and he was remembering more and more fragments of the book he had read. One snowstorm after another hit the Sierra Nevada that winter. The snow had buried everything, including the party's hurriedly constructed camp. It had fallen out on them like the burial shrouds used to cover dead bodies in those days. Jordan glanced back and realized that he could only barely make out Lee in back of him. Lee, he shouted, give me your hand. Lee's cold, stiff hand grasped his tightly. Don't lose me, Jordan, he pleaded. Don't you lose me. I've got you, Jordan yelled. Don't let go. We've got to be close to the car. Jordan squinted his eyes. He thought he could see a mound in the distance, only completely covered with snow. Car, it had to be the car. Over there, he shouted to Lee as they trudged toward the mound. Jordan told himself that he was sticking with the car from then on. No more trying to walk out until he was sure the storms were over. So what if they didn't have food? People could live for days, even weeks, as long as they had water. And Jordan and Lee had all the water they wanted, in the form of snow. Jordan clawed at the mound when he reached it, looking for metal. Finally, he reached something solid under the snow. But it wasn't black, and it wasn't the car. 
end of chapter four. Go ahead and take just a minute to summarize chapter four in your Canvas page.